Welcome to your Libertarian Crusaders, episode 39, with the heroic Matt Freeman of the Status Quo. As always, our co-host John and Cal. Uh, I've had this thought lately that, you know, our society pushes people into like one of three boxes after primary school. One is either college, the military, or prison. Matt, <laughs> I think, has a little bit of experience with all of these, so... Matt, would you like to Two introduce yourself a little bit? Two out of three? Sure. You haven't, done any, yeah. you haven't done any community college or junior college or anything? Uh, tra- I did trade school. And I did EMT basic and then um, paramedic school years ago. But that, I never had any like actual like, you know, associate's degree or anything like that. I just did a bunch of certificate courses. I thought you had um, so, tactical science. What's that? I thought you had a bachelor's in tactical science. Oh, <laughs> yeah, but the problem is it's not from an accredited university, so it's really just a piece of paper. But if I was accredited, then that would certify me as a, you know, big dick pipe player. Right. Wait, can I swear on here? Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, you can swear. Keep it at a medium. Okay. <laughs> All right, I got you. No problem. <laughs> I handle that. So anyway, a uh, quick intro to me. So my name is Matt. I am uh, both an Army veteran and an ex-convict. So. The long story short is that I signed up for the military right after high school, went to the Army. I was 68 Whiskey, which is Army Healthcare Specialist, or more colloquially known as a medic, or if you're a pretentious jerk, a combat medic, but that's kind of a faux pas to refer yourself as a combat medic. It's like having a PhD and insisting people call you doctor. It's just like, eh, you don't want to be that guy. But anyway, <laughs> so I deployed to Iraq in late 06. And spent a total of like about 14 and a half months there. Got back in early 08. And then I uh, basically, long story short, is I had some trouble adjusting back to non-deployment life. And I had some sleep problems and pain problems. And I eventually got on the prescription painkillers, uh, basically got addicted to them. Uh, Piss 30, got kicked out of the military with a uh, other than honorable discharge, bad paper. And then I spent... Uh, about two years drifting there. I uh, worked in EMS or worked in EMS for a little while until I got uh, busted there, also pissed and dirty. And uh, afterwards, I started to deal drugs. I uh, mostly dealt prescription pain pills and some other, you know, pot and some other things too. But eventually, I got arrested because a friend wore a wire on me, and I ended up spending about three years in prison. And then I got out in 2013, and. I've uh, been basically, I got out with about 75 bucks in my pocket and a pair of gray, gray sweatpants. And I've had to claw my way to close to the level I was at before, which I wasn't like, you know, a big ball or something, but I was living an okay life. And it's taken me years to basically rebuild my life. And I'm not complaining. I mean, like, I'm very grateful to be where I am, but it is a tough road to walk. Um, especially when that's, you know, compounded with mental health problems, which I mean, that, that, just about anybody that has substance abuse issues and have that mental health problems is like people don't get, people don't do drugs to get high. Typically people do drugs to feel normal. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's wow. Uh, your friend wore, <laughs> um, was this like a close friend? Uh, I, I thought so. Not like a, not like a best friend, childhood friend, but somebody I definitely was cool with. I hung out with right. somebody I definitely did nice things for. And what had happened essentially is that he had gotten pulled over leaving my house one night after I told him this is back when Oxycontin was still a big thing. I told him some Oxy eighties and the cops essentially, they do what they always do. They lean on somebody and say, Hey, uh, you're going to get a prison for the rest of your life. But if you help us out here, you can get out tonight. So people in that position often, um, give into the, the temptation and often false promises that the police give. So he came back a couple of days later and wearing a wire and they made a total of three buys. And of course, obviously I didn't know any of this until after I had been arrested and we were doing discovery at my, would have been my trial, which I ended up copping out anyway. But yeah, so not a great friend, but certainly somebody I thought I could trust. Wow. Well, yeah, man, your life is full of betrayal. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Typically don't look at it that way, but I guess you got a point. Right. Um, so you were mentioning that you had trouble getting out. You had um, a dishonorable discharge. You have a, uh, yeah, you have. Well, the whole, let me stop you. Yeah. It, it's uh, other than honorable, not dishonorable. 
Right. Yeah. Okay. That, actually, that's a big difference. Uh, otherwise, you have a bigger stack against you too. <laughs> oh, for sure. I mean, well, you know, people, that is actually something really common. People kind of conflate the two, especially people that, um, like employers that haven't been in the military, you know, they'll look at your DD-214 and be like, wait, what? <laughs> Other than honorable, dishonorable. Wait, 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 oh my God. But, um, yeah. So, and of course the big distinction is there are people that have a dishonorable typically will, um, they've been convicted of crime a felony crime in the court martial. That's usually the big difference between the two. But the other than honorable, of course, that can be an administrative discharge. So essentially a, a battalion commander, a lieutenant colonel can just kick you out because they feel like it. So you're to adapt. Yep, there you go. Yeah, it's a health <laughs> discharge, PTS, you know, diagnosis. Yep. Personality disorder. I mean, there's a lot of people who look like they feel a PT that needs to have that uh, kind of discharge. To be honest. Seriously, seriously. And that's just the irony, though, isn't it? You see, you know, maybe I might be a real high speed type of dude. I might be able to run my gun great, do my job fantastic. I can I can run. I kill it on PT. I know all my trivia and history and everything like that. But, you know, I get caught smoking a joint my ass is going to be out in the street, but you have some dude in admin who, or some dude that works at the MWR gym, who's 150 pounds overweight, can't shoot straight to save his life. And the last time he passed the PT test was back when we were still wearing BDUs. Right. They like, <laughs> did get to stay in, but I don't come on now. Right. So I think the other, like I, it, I can't help but notice um, the, the, the piss test and how that like how it's kind of it sounds like a common theme there where it's this thing that's hanging over people <laughs> and uh i can only i've only ever worked like in you know after getting out of college like i've worked in white collar jobs and mm-hmm. i think everybody who's anybody pretty much did something you know or you know all sorts yeah. of drugs i'm sure and there was never any all drug bad. tests and there's like never even a pretense that like yeah you're going to have to do a drug test like i don't remember anybody mm-hmm. ever saying that <laughs> <laughs> that's that's interesting actually it is definitely a thing when you get into um lower paying like more menial blue collar jobs especially skilled trades and of course the military obviously the military uh does probably more drug testing than any other employer on the planet and um it does it does make you wonder how it, like I wouldn't be surprised people that are real high performers in their field, like in white collar type jobs, like sales and things like that. A lot of times those people have higher rates of drug use and abuse. And it it is, and it's kind of like, I kind of have, I see a point because look, if you're going to be operating heavy machinery, yeah, you probably should come to work high. It's probably a danger to everybody else. And it's like, for my example, honestly, I used to be mad about it. I used to kind of be really bitter about it, but honestly, Somebody that's using prescription pain pills really doesn't have any business being around act, having access to narcotics. I mean, that sucks, but it's probably for the best for everybody, including yourself. So in some jobs, I can certainly see why that is, uh, why employers want to do it. However, of course, there's a flip side. A urine test is only proof that you've done a drug within a certain time frame. It doesn't prove that you're high right now. So you could be a you know, you could, you could be a construction operating engineer. You could be working track hose and back hose and stuff like that. And you could be great at your job. You always go get a good night's sleep. You come in clear eyed, broad eyed, bushy tailed, go kick ass at your job all day. And you get home and you smoke a joint to relax. I mean, obviously that's not putting anybody in danger, but you are just as much at risk of losing your job as the guy who's doing meth in the power crane. Well, the thing about cannabis too is the that's the wide net because it stays in your system for, for sure. so long compared to everything yeah. else. Definitely. Coke, a weekend of coke. I had I don't know how many staff sergeants we had get kicked out for cocaine after a long weekend. I don't know about you. <laughs> oh yeah, I've definitely seen that before. Uh, Monday morning, <laughs> mad people. Yep. So I was, uh, you know, you mentioned you know, people who demand they be called doctor if they have a PhD. So I was, a, <laughs> I was an Abrams tank mechanic, which would be considered a line 18? mechanic. So yeah. 90, 91 alpha, which is used to be the medic, you know, MLS right. code prior. Yeah. 91 whiskey back in the day. Yeah. So we always, you know, it was always interesting. We always had to be with the moving element, but right. You know, I 
compare a lot of the the stuff that you and Pat have been talking about, and I finished your gun control episode earlier today, your newest one. Oh, the newest one? Yeah. It's a lot of good content. Think? Oh, it was really good. And at the end, a lot of good info drop, like a very good key piece of info at the very end. So, you know, that nugget at the end entices people to listen till the last moment. It's good. Oh man, I hope so. I, I'm starting, I'm trying to seed some medical content in my shows. And it's funny as I had plans to do, I had plans to do, um, live classes by the summer, but with coronavirus and all that and everything else, it just kind of derailed my entire everything. And with going back to school too, and, you know, getting my certifications back, that's kind of throwing a wrench in things. <laughs> and multiple, I've had multiple people kind of message me in the last couple weeks, like, Hey, I thought you said you're going to do medical content, dude. Like what's, what gives? I was like, yeah, <laughs> you're right. But, um, well, so one good thing, bad. the internet, right? Like one bad thing about the toxicity of people. One good thing is people can hold you accountable and you can build up quite a community a little bit, you know, bad or good. It, you know, <laughs> it's a double-edged sword as with any technology. Anyway, sorry to interrupt yeah. you. No, that's all right. But actually, yeah, it's what you said, like the, the, that is honestly the best thing about podcasting and doing the show, man, is this community of just awesome people. I admit. And I tell you what, like, you know, you guys, I'm sure you probably felt the same at some point in time, but I tell you what, man, when I, when I was fresh out of the military and I've been, and that's the first few years I've been out, like my thought, pro it took me years to come to Liberty. And I kind of, I was a libertarian for a long time before I had an actual name for it. But I used to think I was like this weirdo. I had never met another veteran who was, who was really strongly anti-war. I thought I was like the only person. And then I read um, About Faith by Douglas McGregor. And, or no, sorry, Colonel David Hackworth. Jeez, Douglas McGregor is the other dude. But anyway, that game, as far as guys from my generation, there just wasn't any. But I tell you what, like coming into the liberty world and like, you know, there's a community. And that's the reason I started the podcast because I had nobody to talk to. And I just saw this hole, this huge hole for content that, that should have been there because the thing is, if you look back through history, um, revolutions, evolutions, changes in uh, regimes and whatnot, uh, there's never a change in society until the enforcers of the state get on board, whether that's the police or gendarmes or the military or anything in between. Once the people that do that actually impose the state's will on people, once they start to have a change of heart, society changes and, and things, things you know, either get better or they get worse, but that is who needs to be reached. And there's just such a huge hole. There was such a huge hole for content for, for veterans that believe in liberty because like if you're an anti-war vet, like I was searching for anti-war podcasts on veterans. Dude, it's all a bunch of freaking leftists. It's like, that's cool and all, but I'm not a communist. So, or socialist or anything like that. So when I started this podcast though, I started to realize that there's actually a lot of people that are like-minded like me. And that was the best thing about starting the show is meeting guys that are in the same headspace. Yeah, for me, it's been, um, I, I, I never serving in the military have like, it, it's kind of a surprise hearing from all these military guys that, yeah, everything you think about the government running a program is also true of the government running a military, you know? And, um, for sure. like it, 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 I don't know if you ever read, I'm sure you did war is a racket, but major general Smedley Butler and, and things Absolutely. like that. And you would think like the, the average person could listen to voices like that and say, wow, that's, that's somebody who's actually experienced it. And so this means a whole lot more coming from them. I don't just need to listen to, uh, you know, John McCain or, uh, <laughs> or that dude from what, uh, I forget Nebraska, the pa eye patch, you know, I forget what his name is. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Dan Crenshaw. Right. Right. John yeah. McCain Jr. <laughs> He's from Arizona. <laughs> don't, don't, uh, don't put him with, Nebraska people, please. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think my experience was uh, mostly a uh, hurry up and wait, and uh, I guess the efficiency yep. of time. And then when you look at the mm -hmm. when the budget comes in, and they say, you oh. know, we spend all you know, we have everything we need, but if we don't spend an extra, say, fifty thousand uh, dollars, they're not going to appropriate and fifty thousand dollars. Yeah. Budget, uh, whatever miscellaneous stuff that we need to make sure that we still at least have this amount for next year. So, uh, I think, and a lot of waste 
been there. I think there's, there's an entire agency de- devoted to waste. Um, oh, a hundred percent, man. There's like, I've seen people, I've seen units throw away an entire trash can before, you know, a $15,000 freaking house, basically tent. Uh, just because they have one broken piece you can get for a hundred bucks. I mean, the, enemy, the amount of waste itself is absolutely appalling, certainly. But I think, you know, the one example I always give people when it comes to the military, because the military is socialism, right? It is a socialist state, basically a self-contained one, because just about everything, all the quote unquote means of production, damn near, are owned by the state. And I think the biggest example you can give of why socialism doesn't work is weapons. Is Every piece of equipment, weapon, every weapon I've ever been issued was a piece of garbage. <laughs> and Hand me down. I, I mean, for sure. I've seen like, it's hilarious though. Like the Berettas, dude, the M9, that's the biggest example I can think of. Cause I used to, I used to think those was garbage. This is a piece of junk. You know, they go out of batteries. You jost them a little bit. It this goofy trigger pull. The, it's just garbage. But then, and the sites, of course, build the snowman, the garbage sites. But anyway, um, I went and years later, I shot, uh, my buddy on one when my buddies, that was, I mean, he's actually a tanker. Uh, he, he had an M9 and I was like making fun of him at first. What do you got that thing for? And he's like, no, man, you need to shoot. So I went out and shot it and I was just blown away at what a nice pistol that was. But the military ones, I mean, I've seen guys touchdown spike them before. <laughs> Literally. The, um, the lowest bidder that kind of wins the production of lines of these kind of weapons. Um, exactly. Yeah. I mean, then, something to say maybe about the training or something else that makes uh, certainly uh, the fighting force indomitable in a lot of certain areas, a lot of other areas in terms of waste. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. I, like I've, one, one area in which uh, like I found was uh, a lot of the women that was, that was with me went up getting pregnant and then you'd have to, have to go back home. You have to, you know, all that money and training was just kind of just wasted don't for, for nothing. And they have to retrain someone to come over and, and kind of take their spot. Um, yeah. I'm not, the cost. Shouldn't learn how to shoot guns or be part of militias. But I think, uh, as a fighting force, I think that has kind of lowered a standard for a long time. Now, like even boot camp, I hear like boot camp instructors have to kind of watch their mouth and not be too harsh to, uh, <laughs> harsh their mellow. You can say, um, yeah. How about that, man? I've heard that too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was a rumor going around for a while. I remember, uh, one of my, one of my buddies, his little brother went off to be camp and there was this, we, we, we heard it like fourth hand and we believed it at the time, but there was this whole thing about the idea of the stress card, right? So where every, every recruit had a card and if the, if the drill instructor was yelling at them too much, they could pull, hold that card up and they had to like leave alone for five minutes. Um, now, I've never been able to verify that. I think it's probably not true. But the fact that we believed it, I think, really shows you about how much, like, it really is. It, it, it ain't your daddy's army anymore. It's really not. And, you, you know, with EO and Sharp and things like that, and, and even with all that money spent on those programs, like, still, like, the army has problems that, you know, Sharp was meant to address. But just the fact that I've, I have heard, like, what you said about watering down the standards, yeah, man, um, for, like, okay, so for, like, Medic AIT, one of the last things you do is a 25 mile ruck march, right? And I'll tell you what, half the girls in another platoon ended up finishing that ruck march in the back of an LMTV. They just tapped out and they passed them anyway. And um, I don't know, man, it's just, it really creates a problem when you have people that can't meet the standards in with everybody else. And it's, it just, there really needs to be a failure to adapt to combat arms. They really need to be able to say, look, you know, if you can't hack it, that's okay. This is not for everybody. We need to find something else for you to do, but there's so much resistance to that. Crazy. And instead of wanting to correct the problem, a lot of commanders will just want to get that person out of a unit and they'll just bounce them to another unit. And usually what happens in, you know, there's usually a, a platoon that has the youngest, freshest uh, platoon leader and he gets all the screw ups. And it becomes a screw up with it. Like, <laughs> crazy. You know, I was listening to, um, I don't know if you listen to Dave Smith, part of the problem podcast. Sure. Um, but one of the points that he was making uh, had to do with the, um, the, like the way government in the military, like, 
I forget, I forget exactly the way he phrased it. Um, but like it, it's this, it's this argument against using the military. Oh, you know what? I lost it. I lost my point. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but you, you I, had, I had it. like a socialist state and, and I agree. Um, and I'm not going mm-hmm. back to women again, but like, if you want to have, if you're a single parent as a woman, great place to be. Amazing place to be. Yeah. Especially sure. the baby faces like some of the biggest surges in pregnancies. I'm, I'm pulling this up right now. 74% of unintended pregnancy rate in the Navy. Right. Great way to, if you don't like where you're at. Um, and then you have, uh, you know, childcare, you have everything afforded to you. Yeah. Right. Certainly healthcare too. Like, right. Uh, yeah, um, of course, you know, you, what you get is what you get, but TRICARE, I think on, 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 on balance tends to be a little more effective than care you get. It's actually, you know, organic to units. Um, and that's just the thing is I tell people all the time, like the, the military sucks at healthcare, unless you're bleeding to death. Right. Then they're rock stars. If you're bleeding to death, they'll still give you Motrin. Motrin is their, uh, <laughs> oh, Hey man, we give Mobic too. <laughs> well, Stan, we'll hear some Motrin, you know, uh, for forever. Yeah, for like sure. Motrin. Uh, you know, arm falling off, here's some Motrin. Uh, you know, that's, <laughs> you know, put that in your, like, uh, your Medicaid bag that I guess I'd like to go over in, in, in a bit later to see like, what should we have, uh, I guess, in preparedness. Cause I've seen that your podcast is full of great, pretty much uh shit hit the fan kind of uh preparedness and uh knowing how to survive those kind of situations. Well, thanks, man. Uh, yeah, that's, like, that's a, that's an area of focus. I've definitely wanted to move more into, but yeah, it is funny. Like even the combat pill packs that you're supposed to give a casualty as soon as they're wounded, what do they got in them? <laughs> Augmentin and Motrin. <laughs> as long as you can take that stuff by mouth, you're getting it. But anyway, yeah. Um, I have tried to at least insert some of that because I have this problem, man. Like I have, I'm a, I, my interests and focuses are so wide and varied. I have a really hard time just bearing down on one particular subject and just devoting the show to that. I know I'd probably be, I probably have a little more success if I just found like a, a, a good niche like that. But I tell you, man, I, I really can't. I have a lot of trouble just, just keeping my focus on one particular topic. So that's why like I've done, you know, a little bit of current events, do some history, philosophy, economics, so on and so forth. But, and then of course, like that's like half of the, half of the, um, uh, what's the word here? Half of, not the battle, but it's just, there's more to life than just theoretical and kind of esoteric and academic. Exactly, academic subject. Uh, there's also another half to life, and that is like interacting with the physical world. So the one thing I wanted to do with the show is I want somebody, if they listen to the podcast, I want somebody to walk away with at least one thing they can take and apply to their real life, which is why we started doing the medical content to count the show. And it's like, we can do more stuff about survivalism, but then it's like almost like I have to dedicate the entire show to that. And it's very difficult for me to split it some way 50-50 but I think I'm starting to get some more focus. Like uh, I know one of you guys said, and um, did you listen to the gun control show that came out today? And I had, I announced in the beginning of that, that I'm going to be focusing more on historical subjects and topics. And um, it's been really po- That's usually our most popular shows. And we've gotten a really a lot of positive reception, but I'm thinking though, uh, in addition to that, because the one, the reason I was kind of reluctant to do that, is because those shows take a lot of resources. Like they're very labor intensive. I love history as a subject, but man, I got to do a lot of freaking reading on some subjects I can basically just do on the fly, but some I do got to do a lot of reading on. So that's why I was kind of hesitant to do that, but I decided, you know what, screw it. I'm going to lean into it. But then I'm thinking on balance, the rest of them, we could talk about, uh, you know, combat medicine. We can talk about preparedness. We can talk about um, just everyday medical emergencies and things like that. So that, would be the plan. Let's talk about, um, uh, since uh, I, mean, I find it to be applicable, right? So you have your, you, got, you have your classroom training, right? And then you should have your, uh, the application uh, portion of it. And sure, so what we have kind of going on in the past four months is a lot of chaos out there. Uh, big mm-hmm. lobby, uh, here in Richmond on lobby day. And you have some interesting thoughts about that, that uh, I think is worth uh, looking, exploring into. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure which, what, how to feel about this and what to think about it. But I was, uh, so I, I was, 
I was discussing with some other guys, heard people talking. Like I heard one of them say it was because basically like if most people, if you, what I've been exposed to talking to, most people have said that thing was a resounding success. And I found a couple guys that were in a, kind of in our orbit that were dissenting from that view. And they called it the big begaloo. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason their reasoning was and it's like it's one thing in a reaction they got was like oh well you didn't show up there like you know they're kind of poo-pooing the idea and i understand that because like a lot of people put a lot of effort into that and they certainly don't want to feel like what they did was pointless and somebody saying that's pointless of course that's going to hit a nerve obviously but to look a little deeper into that so they, they pose an interesting question here it is so if you are going to come armed to a protest, there is an implicit threat there. I think there's an implicit threat anytime you have a large gathering of people. That's why, like, I'm sure you guys have seen this whole thing going down in St. Louis where they had those two, uh, like, lawyers that were confronting a bunch of people that were moving through the neighborhood. I'm sure you guys have seen that, right? Yep. Yep. It, it turned into a meme, and their, their guns got seized, and they both got charged, actually, uh, just recently. And um, it's like, look, you can't go around flagging people with your finger on the trigger. That's very stupid. And uh, you shouldn't do that. Um, but there is a question, and I had a big argument with my girlfriend about this. Her and I got in a shouting match, actually, which is just ridiculous over something that doesn't matter at all to either one of us. But um, that is a question, though. So is 300 people on your front yard, is that an implicit threat of force? There is, is there a point where a group of people goes from... Um, you know, being Protest. neutral, right, to being threatening. So if I come up to you, right, and I'm like, hey, dude, you stole my parking spot. That's one thing. But if I come up to you with seven of my buddies and I say, hey, dude, you stole my parking spot, that creates a different dynamic, doesn't it? Right. Right. 100%. Okay. So, hell yeah. So um, then that's the whole thing is that at, at a, any protest, there is an implicit threat of force. That's kind of like where the tradition comes from is from, like England, France, a lot of the European, like the continental countries, people would go out and protest. They would be marching. But the threat was always, look, government here, we're telling you we're pissed off. But of course, if that's just all it is, it's like, okay, cool story, bro. Who cares? But if, if, the, if the other half of that is government, we're pissed off. You need to stop this or we're going to drag you out of your castle and hang you in the street. Like there has to be an implicit threat of violence. Otherwise it's just a bunch of people standing around holding signs and yelling. So the, when it comes to the Virginia, especially like if it's an armed protest that I think that dynamic stays the same. I don't think it really changes whether you're armed or unarmed because a mob of people without guns can create just as much havoc as a mob of people with guns, honestly. So um, anyway, the thing is, is that, when those people, when the went to the rally, I heard people say like, it was a resounding success. Everything went great. And they were like kind of bragging, especially to the left. That there wasn't any violence. Somebody got shot. No, hardly anybody got arrested. Uh, except for one girl who was wearing a face mask, which is ironic considering our present day circumstances. But, um, that is ironic as hell. Now, yeah. Right. Now you get arrested for not wearing one. <laughs> right. right. What the hell? Yeah. For real. So anyway, um, so the the guy that I was uh, kind of interacting with, he said this, and it really made me think. He said, look, you're coming to it with the wrong mindset. Because if you come to it and you're saying like, oh, um, I'm bringing my rifle, but I'm hoping that there's no use of force, there's no, there's no violence, uh, and I'm, I'm hoping and praying that nothing bad happens. Well... Then the question you have to ask question, okay, why are you coming on then? What is the point? Um, is that the wrong frame of mind to have? Or you should have the frame of mind like, look, are you, you know, asking the government, so are you going to change what you're doing or are we going to have a problem here? And that's the thing is that you have to have, like, you have to, everybody has to answer this question for themselves. Where is your red line? Everybody has one or should have one anyway. And it's a question of where is yours? So, uh, like, look at all the laws that were passed in, in Virginia. And people are trying to go through the political process. And, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to knock them, you know. I don't live down there. So if that's what they I, – I, I'm a, the reason I'm a libertarian is because I don't want to tell people what to do. I don't know what's best for you. So if that's what they want to do, that's their choice. But I think we have to ask a the question then. So, okay. So 
you show up to this rally, right? All the people around, uh, you know, with guns, nothing happens, and then they pass laws anyway. Okay, so so now what then? What happens next time? Because essentially, what happened is that the there was a you know a, the government and the people got in each other's faces, and unfortunately, the people blinked. Now, I'm not saying that it would have been good for there for people to just go and start like just, you know, eating cops and whatnot. That's not what I'm saying, but there was certain lines that the governor had drawn where they had this free speech zone, this cage essentially where you had to disarm to go into it. And it's like, there was plenty of room for civil disobedience. And that would be the time to do it since you have essentially, you know, 20,000 people or however many backing you up there. So I would have loved to see like people crash, crash the fence, you know, armed and just walk into the Capitol, that would have been great or something like that. But that's just the thing is that that's not what happened. And so now next time, right, the, the entire reason that we have the Second Amendment in America is that that is the backstop for the republic, supposedly. And the reason that we have rifles is so that the government doesn't come and try to take them. And if the government cut, comes and tries to take them, we're supposed to use them. Other than that, they, 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 as long as they don't come and try to take them, they stay, you know, they stay in the safe or wherever they might be. Well, here's the thing, is that the government is going to try to, especially in Virginia. So the question is, as a, as a gun rights activist, as a, as a lover of liberty down there, what do you do? What do you do? You right. might be able to resist by, by yeah, yourself. I, I, was, I was struggling with it personally because I was, I was of the opinion, you know, like what, what I took from all those people being present in that, in that place, all with a bunch of guns. And I was there for like a few minutes cause I had to go to a funeral in Northern Virginia, but the, uh, the whole, the whole picture of it, I thought was, it was positive in the sense that here's like a show of force. Right. Mm-hmm. And for some people that show of force would have been much better if it had been, Oh, just, you know, step inside the gun free zone. And then that's a statement that your rules, you know, you can't limit us in this, in that way. But to me, I just saw it as like a, that's, that's a lot of people that are willing to drive down to this place and show, show what they've got and, and uh, show the government that uh, they're not afraid in a sense, you know, that's what I, that's what I took from it anyway. I think. uh, Yeah. I I, Go go ahead, bud. Yeah. Yeah. I'm piggybacking on that, that, uh, you know, (laughs) Um, the last time, uh, you saw a show of force of 20, I'll say it was 50,000 people converge at a place with so many firepower, right. In America. Right. Mm-hmm. So it, it hasn't happened. It's never, I don't think it's ever happened. Not in that capacity. I don't think so. Right. Either. So I think what when, you, when people look at politics, people look, you know, they see there's a threat. Politics is an attempt to try to see if we can resolve this at least peacefully, right? There's right. Instead of like having to overthrow the king, you can change the king, right? You know, and yeah. change the governor. You know, we don't have to go all right to war with each other and then, you know, we'll be leaving with missing limbs. Um, so, so we have that, at least uh, as an attempt to see, we can do a peaceful, at least the show force that happened on, uh, on, on the gun rally day, which is an annual thing, actually. You know, there's a thousand people mm-hmm. every year in Richmond. Um, yeah. That... Uh, the show force that was shown there, I think was, uh, it's funny because we, we, sometimes we talk about like, you know, like what are, what are the, the Democrats think of our arguments? You know, what do, what do they think about all this guns that we have? Like, doesn't that lead to so much violence? You know, there's like 50,000 people with so much guns there that you know, there wasn't any kind of violence, but I don't, I think we just stop trying to prove to them anything after that point. Um, and at the same time, as you're mentioning, uh, I think what Virginia did then at Richmond was show that, you can do something like this and give other people across the country, I guess, uh, the iron balls to do things like take over the Michigan Capitol, because they never did that until after the gun rally thing happened. Right. There's been yeah. an interesting show of force against the state since that happened. And I don't think that's something that can go backwards. Yeah, absolutely. Next year, during gun rally day, we're pushing the fence line. <laughs> you, you see what happens with, uh, uh, with how they treat with these protesters and let them just destroy and wreck the city and businesses, right? Everything down, like right. So they set the bar pretty high, right? And they're <laughs> uh, and, and to that it's nothing. Let them riot. Let them destroy the city, right? Yeah. But to disagree with you for really quick, I think that's an interesting point that you mentioned Antifa and all those guys because they're not armed. 
And so it's not all of them. Some of them it's are. an incredible, well, yeah, maybe they're hiding like a pistol or something, but it's an incredibly different dynamic. Cause if you're armed, that could turn into a bloodbath really quick. But if, if they, they have a, no expectation that someone's going to shoot live rounds back at them, you know? Right. And I think that's an incredible, that's valuable in their mind that they're only going to get hit with tear really? gas or something. Yeah. I, mean, I think a better show of force on our end would be a, a way like have community community defense against red flags. Show them yeah. that we wouldn't allow them to come into our communities. Like they're going to force us to get a background check. They need to get a background check. Fuck that. Sure. Shit. They're not <laughs> yeah, passing. Yeah. Um, yeah, so if I could respond to what you guys said, I had a couple points I was thinking of while you guys were talking. Um, first off, I'll go start from the beginning. Okay, so no, actually, I do understand. I, if I'm going to see something positive out of that, I didn't think about how that has actually probably spurred other actions. That, that's a very good point. Um, also, too, like the fact that there is like a kind of like a propaganda is not quite the right word, but kind of like a propaganda victory there. It's propaganda indeed, where um, the narrative, the mainstream narrative is always like, oh, this is why we can't have guns because people will shoot each other. It's so dangerous. And it's just like, if a gun exists in your house, like it, you know, your chance of suicide goes up, you know, all those kind of BS garbage like that. But then people go out and they show like they can, like people, like guns do not equal gun violence. So that is, yeah, that I can see as a positive. Um, but the thing is, like, especially when it comes to community defense and, and, and against red flag laws and things like that. And that's what it is, is that, one problem we have, we, we, we live in like a low trust society. We really do. People don't trust each other uh, for the most part. You live in a city, you know, you, what's the first thing you do when you get home? You turn around your door. Um, it's not like that in all communities. But most places it is people lock their cars. Um, you know, people, we should have some situational awareness when we're walking around. We, we do live in a low trust society. And I think it's probably a product of the fact that we have so many different cultures coming in and, and mixing and, and sometimes clashing. But the, the effect of that basically is it's made people less, they don't know their neighbors anymore. Uh, and I've made a concerted effort to get to know people on my street. Unfortunately, most of them are retirees. <laughs> but I've made a concerted effort to get to know people, to know their names, to be friendly with them, and try to build up some kind of community from where I stand right now. Because that's what it's going to take. It's, it's, it's the, the show of force is, is great now, but where the rubber meets the road, it's going to be in small groups. And it's going to be small communities. And, and the fact that the government has basically destroyed social, civil society because they've taken over things like welfare, where things like the Lions Club and Key Club and Kiwanis, like these groups that used to be dominant in American society, basically don't exist anymore. And that's where you would meet a lot of people. And, you know, besides for like, you know, us, man, like we can go to the American Legion. Sure. But that's about it. So anyway, um, here's how I like to frame this whole thing. I like to think of this as essentially it's, it's fourth generation warfare is what it is. It's a regular, it's a regular warfare. And the one of the fourth generation warfare is not just about like bullets and tactics and uh, L shaped ambushes. It's also about the informational war. And that's the way I kind of think of it. And if you consider this, right. So the, the state, the enemy owns the schools, owns the media, has a basically a monopoly on the narrative. And as for insurgent groups, there's two things that you really need to be success, successful. One is grievances, whether they're real or perceived. The other is a narrative. You have to be able to dominate the narrative. Like you go all the way back to the American Revolution, right? What's the first thing that happened after uh, Lexington and Concord? Well, the rebels find the fastest ship they can get a hold of in Boston Harbor. They give them a message and they tell them to go haul ass over to England. And as a result, they get their version of events printed in the newspapers before the British government did. And that shaped the narrative and it changed people's perception in England. So the fact of the matter is the, the state owns the narrative for the most part. And that means it's like, say somebody gets red flag that you know, everybody shows up and the thing turns into a shootout. That is a disaster on so many levels. And one of the levels that is a disaster on is the informational side, because you can you can just hear it now, the narrative being shaped. Anti-government, extremist, white supremacist, murders, hero, police officer <laughs> trying to do his... You can hear it. <laughs> it, it. It makes itself. So therefore, if we're doing this thing, you've got to be smart about it. It's not just about out and out starting some kind of war. That's not the way this thing is going to go. That's probably the worst thing that can honestly happen. So, and of course, 
everything we say here is hypothetical. Brandenburg v. Ohio. Um, anyway, <laughs> uh, the thing is, is that it's, it's about it's about shaping the narrative, and like we all have a we all have a camera in our pocket, and one of the best things you can honestly do is take a take take one for the team. Like if, if you were, let's say your hypothetical red flag defense, let's say you assemble a small group of like-minded people and somebody goes to get red flagged, right? They're outside their house and everybody shows up. You should have like, I remember, okay, so like I, there was a, a couple months ago, there was a couple businesses that opened up and they had some boot boys and guys with rifles kind of guarding them, right? You remember that? Yep. Yeah, down in Texas, okay, and there's, I think. Yeah, there was, there was a multiple ones. There was the, there was the salon. And then there was another one I was thinking of um, where like the cops rolled up in like a Lenko Bearcat and a couple of, I might have an MRAP too, but the cops rolled yeah, up and these guys so. like boom, immediately surrendered, right? And the smart thing to do then is to either have somebody with a GoPro or somebody whip out their phone camera and start recording. Because here's the thing about the government. They will do something very stupid because they're the government. That's what they always do. And all you have to do is get the stupid thing caught on tape. And how many, how many videos of it will it take of somebody getting the shit kicked out of them before people start getting angry and before more people start to think like, hey, this is screwed up. We shouldn't be doing this. So that's just like one example I can think of, of, of how this dynamic is. And I think it's really helpful for us to examine it through that lens of like basically a, you know, a, an irregular warfare because that's essentially what it is. I mean, the state declared war on us a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's but, uh, essentially blowback, you know, for sure. the more, yeah. more we turn the narrative. I heard a great comparison uh, in that, in that vein uh, about blowback as it relates to uh, the Middle East and Al Qaeda and mm -hmm. blow, blowback as it relates to um, Antifa and mm -hmm. various, various political movements lately. Uh, it doesn't have to be Antifa and it could be, you know, the, the boog, the boog boys or whatever. And, Every action from the government does result in these pockets of people that are dissatisfied with what's happening to them. And, yes. you know, yes. maybe most people would say no, uh, or they're fine with it. And you let them steamroll us, but there's always a small number that are like, now nah, we're going to fight back. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think like a good example, um, I'm getting ready to do a series on the Irish Republican movement. So nice. this is like Sinn Féin, IRA, yeah, Easter Rising, all that. And we're going to go way, way back to um, like the 1800s. And one thing you notice, so <clears throat> the Easter Rising, like the Easter Rebellion in 1916, wasn't really that popular with people when it happened. Like people, the, the rebels themselves, like people threw, threw rotten fruit at them and cussed them out and told them to go home and stuff like that. But the thing was, what really got people converted to their side to be radicalized was not what the 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 British or what, what the Irish rebels did. It was what the British did in response. When they put the when they brought the hammer down and they started executing those people, that's what really radicalized people. And another thing too is that after that you had the the conscription crisis. So conscription had been instituted in England in, in 1916 already in the UK, everywhere except Ireland. And the reason that the Parliament didn't bring it onto Ireland because they thought it was going to start a rebellion. So they were in 1918, like it wasn't obvious that the British were going to win the war. They were actually on the verge of losing. So uh, the British government started considering bringing conscription to Ireland and people were not having it. So they had, um, you know, mass strike, mass general strikes, resistance movements, so on and so forth. And the IRB, which would, would become the IRA, the Irish volunteers, all those groups, they got in on that stuff. And what happened was the British started locking up people for just being associated with the IRB or, you know, they were locking up people at mass arrest after the Easter rising too. And what happened was when people were in those jail cells in those British prisons, they were radicalized. And it's been documented in multiple history books that the, they basically said that those prisons were like a guerrilla warfare university. Mm. And that's what really got the IRA, the old IRA being built up. And you're absolutely right. It is. It's, it's when you're, when you're the, the David and not the Goliath, you have to rely on not your own actions, but your enemy's reaction. And that's just it is that, you know, David provoked Goliath into doing something stupid and then he saw his opportunity and whacked him with the stone. Same thing here. I'm reading, uh, right now I'm reading IRA by Tim Pat Coogan, which is uh, a really oh, interesting yeah. book. So 
Yeah, dude. Tim Pat Coo. That's probably one of the best books I've, I know of about that subject. Yep. You mentioned about uh, narrative being important. And I think that's also uh, a great thing to kind of keep in mind. Uh, for example, uh, you know, we talk about the, the gun rally is setting a precedent for a lot of people to uh, take the extra step. Um, I yeah. I want to go yeah. further in the past a little bit that, and go to the Bundy Ranch uh, and bolding that, I would say, in terms yeah. of am, I've ever seen where uh, you can say civilians, Americans, uh, with their sights on federal agents, right? And can mm-hmm. if they want to, but they're not being shot back at, right? They're not. Right. Good point. Uh, I think when you, you know you look at the question why it this has to do with private property, right? The more argument they mm-hmm. go, could it uh, take over and show a better narrative than that they're taking over someone else's land? Uh, where, right. Whereas the opposite, you know, the unfortunate part where you know they later got acquitted with the Bunny Brothers was that they took over federal property, right? At the wildlife. Uh-huh. So now government can say you're trespassing. Now government can say uh, you are acting criminal, right? Now they can control the narrative. Very good point. Right. And kind of shift it and in, in the acts of uh, criminality that they did upon them and murdering <coughs> the brothers. So yeah, the, Certainly. the narrative is very important. I think uh, in terms of what happens uh, later on, I think it's something for people to kind of keep in mind in terms of how people will approach this, these kind of situations. Um, you know, and if yeah, just to like, you know, you bring guns out there to show them like, yes, it's a threat, but it's also to you know, people who, who do that to keep, to get ready. You know, it's a, uh, it's a one way ticket, you know, it's, it's one way road. You can't go back after that. You're absolutely right. Uh, the first shot that's ever fired is like, there's no coming back from that. It's, it's, you're already, I agree. It. Um, so you know, that's why it's so important that it doesn't happen. Right. Yeah. I, I need to have more children. I, I need children first. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so to something. Right. I need a legacy, you know, that I could pass my, <laughs> uh, otherwise it ends with me. So yeah. So right. Yeah. Hopefully we could try to find a piece of way through it. Um, but if all this fails, yeah, no one wants to do it, but I was reading, uh, that's it. I was reading this, uh, I was finishing up Democracy, the God that Failed by uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe. And he, great book. He, he's, uh, he goes, it's so great. He goes into his discussion about private militaries and private, uh, like he basically calls it insurance company militaries. Mm-hmm. Like they would be extremely powerful, like way more powerful than any government military. Yeah. And it's hard to wrap your mind around that idea because we're so used to civilians having jack shit as far as like anything what the mil- compared to the, what the government has. And, um, Certainly. I think, I think we need to kind of change our perception of that. And, you know, really that your, our expectations should be like, no, we, we should have way more. Like if the government Ooh. is socialism and produces crappy, um, welfare programs and healthcare programs. Uh-huh. It also produces, like you said, you know, bad, lousy uh, firearms and 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 that sort of thing. So, w- you know, yeah. imagine what we could have if uh, free markets dominated uh, weaponry and militaries. And so. yeah, uh, let me add to that real quick before I forget it. You know, one other thing about the Virginia rally and like everything that's happened since is that I think a positive actually is that it's starting to introduce the mainstream society to what the new gun owner looks like because people have like this image in their mind of like, you know, a FUD with a Remington 1100 uh, out duck hunting wearing blaze orange, <clears throat> but no, the new gun owner has an AK or an AR and where's the plate carrier. Where's tactical gear. That is what the new young gun owner looks like. And I think it's important that people see that because that needs to be normalized. Um, so much the picture of Ron Paul. Yeah. I think there's a psychological, yeah to it too because you know they're coming and dressed up looking as, as me uh knowing the kind of hostile environment that they're in wearing hawaiian mm-hmm. shirts <laughs> you know you look at your enemy mm-hmm. and you think they're like well they're crazy to come out like that like maybe they're crazy to do other things you know pink polo shirts now right That's the new <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh man it's up right um <laughs> What, what do you think about the uh, situation that's going on um, now in terms of um, Portland, for example? Um, oh, um, you know, man, I actually haven't 
uh, I haven't caught up on that too much lately. I will say this though, is that I've seen like from our circles and a lot of my kind of Liberty friends, I've seen them doing something that really kind of bugs me, man. They're like celebrating, um, you know, these, these like leftists getting disappeared by basically what equates to secret police. And I have to say, man, I'm kind of disappointed by that because you don't even have to think that hard about it. There's an old poem. First, they came for the trade union, and I did not cry out because I was not a trade unionist. And I mean, that's exactly what happened in Nazi Germany is that they just started knocking off groups on the fringe until eventually nobody was left to oppose them. And it's just, it's, I've, I've had arguments quite a bit with, with kind of guys in the Liberty world about this. And they, they basically say like the enemy of the enemy is my friend. It's like, no, dude, the government is not your friend. Not at all. That's your big enemy. And to think that to, to, to applaud while they're persecuting your enemies as detestable as they may be, is just dumb because guess what guys, we're just as much on the fringe of society as they are. And we're next. And if we ain't next, we'll be next after that. So the idea that we should applaud the secret police persecuting people that we don't like is, I think is just really short-sighted. So instead, I would much rather see, uh, you know, not that we can really do much, but we, <laughs> we can all condemn it, sure, and wag our finger and say, government, don't do that. Okay, that doesn't do anything. But also, we shouldn't be celebrating it either because it'll be our turn sooner or later. That, uh, <laughs> that poem about... Um... You know, I wasn't a communist and they came for me. I'll, I'll take mm-hmm. this side of it, to be honest, because uh, there is, uh, you know, the, the escalation that they say, you know, and I wasn't a Jew and, you know, and there's nobody left to talk about me. But, you know, uh, and people talk about, you know, the source of this happening from the um, National Defense Authorization Act under Obama push through. But uh, I think it'll, that it'll escalate from there. It's like that's not true, because the first time this happened was uh, under Lincoln. And Lincoln suspended habeas corpus and disappeared a great many thousands of people, politicians and news reporters and everybody back in the 1800s. Yeah. At 1800s. Yep. And escalate from then. Right. So it, and that's not like he disappeared the whole country. Um, yeah. I, I think, um, of course, everybody knows is a, is a good, st- you know, it's not a, a great argument against people who are volunteerists and ANCAPs like, yes, state is bad. Uh, but I won't lie to say, uh, you know, these people want a state, right? The people who are out there in Portland desire a socialist state. Uh, you know, right. they shouldn't be surprised when a socialist state uh, does something socialist <laughs> when the Fed. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so, you know, so so in that sense, like, yeah, uh, you know, it's kind of like that Joker meme. You know, you, you get what you, you ask for in, in a way. You get what you deserve. Right. Right. You get to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I get it. I mean, I do. I am sympathetic to understand that because like. Here is the other side of that argument, too, if you were to continue. Okay, so as the society we live in, it's not our ideal society, right? And the state is the one that has the monopoly on violence. We all agree. Right. So as long as they have the monopoly on violence, I would like to see them using that monopoly on violence to stop people that are destroying property and hurting people. Right. Yeah, sure. Because I, th- I don't think there's a volunteerist out there that would say, I'm so mad the government locked up this murderer. Right. No, I don't think we think like that. It's, I mean, especially when it comes to the, uh, the subject of child molesters, like, yeah. <laughs> you know, how many wood chipper memes are there out there? <laughs> but anyway, the, the thing about that is, um, um, okay. So if we are going to have this state that we live in the society, well, it should be arresting people that are out destroying private property and hurting people. Certainly. However, though, there's the other side of that argument is that we have a process for that already. We have a court system, not a, legal, not a justice system, we have a court system. And it is, it is uh, you know, done out in the open and there's limits on what the government can do as far as arrest powers and, and, and you know, right to a speedy trial and a jury trial. And the pro- proceedings are supposed to be public so people can make sure the government's not doing something, you know, crazy tyrannical. So if I'm, we're going to have this type of action, I would... I would really much rather see it happen under the auspices of the regular court system. Local. Like there's no, there's no reason that those guys, they could have had patches, you know, but, on their, on their uniforms. They could have announced but the, the, where. The thing they're, they're federal agents. Federal agents don't, are not like law enforcement people. Uh, so federal agents right. have official uh, federal vehicles. They don't have anything. They actually rent them out, you know? So there's uh, they don't have yeah. markers like, uh, like enterprise. 
from yeah, enterprise. <laughs> so people are complaining like they're they're getting these vehicles that they're into. Like that's how the federal government works. They, they don't really have mm-hmm. official federal government vehicles. They don't have. I mean, there are some, but not that many. Right, for law enforcement now. Right, right. And so, like, when you're attacking a federal building and trying to set it on fire, you're going to have a federal uh, response to that, which is what's happening now in Portland. But uh, yeah, at, at the same yeah. time, looking at you know the mayor or the people in that city who are just letting it hands off and letting all these people suffer. And that's like, they need somebody. They, they're looking for yeah. somebody just to stop this. You know, people are trapped in there. Sure. Um, and I'm not saying, yeah, it'd be great if there was a militia there to, to sweep it up. You know, the, you could say mm-hmm. if there was no federal government, all these problems will go away within a week. Well, what I like about this, right. what I like about this is that we're having a discussion about the state's, and the feds and the rights of the states and the rights of the states to say, no, we don't want federal agents coming to our state mm-hmm. doing X, Y, Z. And I think that's a really good thing we can capitalize on. Um, yeah. That libertarians can talk about because we have all the answers. You know, everybody yeah. wants to, everybody wants to be like, uh, no, uh, you know, I like the feds when they enforce the stuff that I like. And it's like, no, you know, mm-hmm. we don't want, we don't want any of them. We, we want to have our right. own Lichtensteins, you know? So I think that's, um, I think that's where I've been trying to go with it. It's just to say that we don't, uh, we, we should use this as an opportunity to limit the power of the federal government and uh, decentralize. Yeah, yeah I think you, it's a you way, definitely got a point there. I think it's a way to frame up a dialectic to divide and rule, yeah. really. Um, Absolutely. So, like, on a more, like, what I want to talk about is would you define education different than schooling and could you put your finger on the difference between the two of them yeah sure okay so there's a really good um analogy that jack you guys ever listen to the survival podcast jack spearco i did for a while but i yeah. i'm about to get back into it yes he's um he's great man i absolutely love him so he had this analogy right where you have potty trained versus potty educated, right? So your your parents potty trained you, right? They showed you, they, they modeled, demonstrated behavior. They showed you how to use a toilet. Um, that's potty trained when they show you how to do the thing. But somebody that's potty educated, they could say, okay, um, here we're going to uh, have some presentations and PowerPoints. This is how fluid dynamics works. This is uh, how the flapper valve in the toilet works. This is where the sewage goes. This is how municipal water is created. They're potty educated. So education is more, it's about, it's the, it's the trivium, right? Grammar, rhetoric, and logic. So you're learning like the philosophy behind things. You're learning how something works, but you're not actually getting, getting your hands on a thing and learning how to do it. Like, okay. So for another good example is that, how about a gunfight? So you can be gunfight trained, right? Like somebody can take you out to the range, show you how to shoot a rifle, show you how to shoot a pistol, show you how to do transitions how to do combat reloads and administrative reloads and the difference between the two, show you how to, you know, move, maneuver and fire, show you how to, um, you know, uh, what else here? You can show you how to like fire from a probe position or on your side or on your back or from your knees or, or anything like that. Okay. That's gunfight trained, right? If you're gunfight educated, well, you're going to learn about, you maybe go to a class, you learn about the history of firearms. You study some famous gunfights. You talk about uh, ballistics and wound when, and you know wound channels, dynamics, expansion of different rounds. You might be able to name off the uh, muzzle energy of uh, all these different rounds and different manufacturers and stuff like that. But you don't actually know how to win a gunfight. So that's the difference between I think schooling and education. Um, even though, really, I guess so. Framing it like that, schooling is is essentially. That's when, in our modern time, a state takes you through a system, has a a dedicated curriculum, and they teach you what they want you to know. Um, However, education is quite a different thing because it has to be self-led. And, um, shit, I just lost my place. Uh, You nailed (laughs) a bunch there that I'm actually super, like, uh, I was going to ask your method of critical thinking that you applied and you know, you already hit the trivium. So I'm pretty impressed oh, with that. <laughs> I don't, I don't know if I really have like a, a method to be honest, because I just kind of, just kind of do my thing, I guess. I don't know. I, I guess I'm, I'm kind of lucky in that sense because 
not to toot my own horn here, but I am fairly intelligent. So I'm, I'm lucky like that I was, you know, born with a brain that's functional enough for me to, you know, get by in life and do these different things and, and whatnot. So in that respect, um, yeah, like Matt, with your podcast, when I listen to your podcast, I'm like, this guy's got an active brain. Like he is, he's got a lot going on in his brain. He's thinking about a lot of things. He's bringing the receipts as, uh, <laughs> <laughs> as they say. And, uh, yeah. And, uh, that's Pete Raymond. Yeah. And, uh, it's just like, I'm just like, I can't picture you being in the military and having to stifle <laughs> all that stuff going on in your brain. Um, <laughs> because it's like, they want you to do, Dude. you know, X, Y, Z and not, you can't do more than that. <laughs> let me, let me tell you something, man, is that I wasn't always, I wasn't always like this. I never had this intellectual curiosity until after I got in the military. Uh, and, and when I was, you know what I did when I was in the military, I kept my head down. I didn't ask questions. I did what I was told. I showed up in the, I showed up on time in the right uniform in the right place. And that was basically what I did. I didn't mess around at all. I didn't, well, obviously did drugs, but like I didn't ever think for myself. I never had an original thought the whole time I was in there. Uh, and to look back on it now, it's like, man, I just, I wish I would have been more critical of all these things that happened around me. But what really did it honestly was going to prison actually. That's what really sparked my intellectual curiosity because I always had like the brain power. Like I, I, I zoomed right through AIT. I, you know, I zoomed through every training class, whatever that they gave me. I was always able to do tasks and whatnot, but I never really thought like outside the box at all. until I went to prison, I started, started reflecting on my life and asking questions and going down this rabbit hole. And I was fortunate enough to um, have access to the library in, in prison, which it wasn't, you know, it was it's not the Library of Congress, certainly, but it, there is a lot of material there. And I, the only two things I did, well, the only three things I did in prison were work out, read books, and jerk off. So that was uh, really the gateway, man. And it wasn't until I started questioning things actively until I really opened up my own mind. I think that uh, I think that in the military, right, you have a certain level of freedom, so you're never truly trapped with your own thoughts. But when you're in prison, no. and then when you start to spar with somebody else's thoughts from a book in prison, something like that, where you have nothing but time, I think that really starts to force you to question things a lot more. I don't know if that rang true with you yeah. too, but that helped well, me. Certainly. And you know, the other big thing too was like after I got out and I had a felony conviction, man, that's when I really started seeing these inconsistencies. That's what really, it's like glitches in the matrix, right? When, and obviously that's the old tire cliche, but Neo in the matrix, right? So he, he sees like a cat go by him twice or, or whatever, right? That's the glitch. Well, I started thinking to myself, like, and, and when I got out like a prison, I was, I was always, I was always a big, you know, gun enthusiast. I grew up shooting, you know, I learned, I had my first rifle when I was like 10. And it's really, really deeply ingrained in my family and culture I came from. So when I got out of prison, obviously, like if you're a convicted felon, you're legally disarmed. Like you are, you have a dis weapon disability. So I started thinking to myself and being angry. And like, I started talking to people and I always ask them this, this kind of gotcha question. And I always say, okay. So especially like I work with a lot of right wingers. And I always like when I, before I had my record sealed, I used to always ask some questions like, okay, so, uh, I sign up for the military. I get put on a plane with a rifle and you guys are cheering me on saying I'm serving my country. I'm doing a great thing. Right. And you trust me with not only my rifle, but with grenades, with rocket launchers, with a grenade launcher, with a mortar, with machine guns. And when I get back, right. I'm not allowed to own a 22, 10, 22. So I have to ask then what's the difference between me then and me now when you were applauding me having a gun and actually using it on people. But now I want to have one for self-defense and you say that I can't, I'm not allowed because I'm a bad person. So why is that? What changed? And obviously I never got a satisfactory answer, but seeing those, seeing those inconsistencies. And the other thing too, it's like, um, 
and I'll, I'm sorry, man, I didn't mean to cut you off, but just real quick. So the, the way veterans are actually treated in our society versus how the perception is, and I don't want to be like, oh, boo-hoo, uh, nobody cares about me, I'm a voter. Not, I'm not trying to say that, but you see all the adulation, man. Like I walk by Kroger's grocery store every freaking night I go there. There's an enormous wall-sized mural of um, thank you all for our heroes. And there's like a, a, a nurse and a cop and a, and a guy or a girl actually in ACU. So this imagery is everywhere, right? Go to watch an NFL game. There's, there's military propaganda just beating you over the head. It's, it's, they put it on thick. So they talk about how much they love and respect soldiers and about how we're just the pride of this nation and so on and so forth. But when you get back and you have problems and you need their help, they'll just toss you in the scrap heap. Because as soon as you uh, finish your deployment and you're back in the States, you go from the asset side of their balance sheet to the liability of their balance sheet. And they will, they will kick you out and on the curb if it's inconvenient for them or if you have problems. And then also, like when you get out of the military, like <laughs> um, people say they give a shit about veterans. And some of them truly do. I'm not saying they, they really don't. But most people... Like, it's just not something they think about. It's not something they consider. And the way, like, we have things like Operation Vigil and Eagle, and you have, like, the VA, you know, pu putting flags in people's NICS files if they have a fiduciary, if they have somebody handle their affairs. And, like, you see the way that, like, people actually are treated. Like, how many fucking homeless vets are there in this country? How many thousands? Um, that's, like, <laughs> that should never be a thing. So the fact that you see that, as soon as you have outlived your usefulness, the state will just toss you like the, like a piece of garbage. Yeah. I remember after the civil war, I read somewhere, it was like the South was just treating oh. their, their veterans like uh, Kings. Like they were going into massive bankruptcy, like the States were yeah. destroying their budgets because they were spending a lot of money on these, uh, these guys. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, I guess that's not the case anymore. <laughs> and, no, it's not. <laughs> I mean, the VA is the third biggest line item in the in the u.s federal budget but look at what you get there right wow it, car it carries substandard at best what does it mean i mean there are two and i was gonna say like what's when you uh when you're in the military and you swear an allegiance to your country um and you swear allegiance to america but sometimes the right. way, uh worded is very secularized as it seems like a very you could say globalist sort of thing because oftentimes even like some of our amendments don't particularly say citizens they say the people like in a loss of identity, mm -hmm. your, your allegiance to like the whole world in a way. Um, so yeah. I, like maybe like when you get out of the military, there is a suspicion then like, who's your allegiance to now? Right. Cause usually in the military, right. you have a superior that not that, that you answer to, but that's responsible that if you do anything wrong, he's in trouble, <laughs> he's in charge. Um, yeah. but you look at the same thing that could happen, like, like, like in England in terms of like, uh, you have talk about gun control. Like this was a country that like dominated the world. Uh, and, and now, you know, you go to jail if you hold a little sword or a little knife or a butter knife, uh, you know, what, what, what that's ironic about that too. What's that? Um, sorry, man. I didn't mean to cut you off. <clears throat> Is that this, uh, country, right? You can be go be thrown in prison if you have a knife that's three and a half inches long, but they just sold like $50 million worth of smart guided munitions to a country that bombs wedding. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, anyway, sorry. The, the question about like how you did so well, uh, you know, going back and circling back into we were looking at the state or like the military at, at the times being very socialistic. And when things are uh, social, you know, they call it the warfare or a welfare warfare state, you know, uh, yeah. for and there's a warfare, you know, it's this kind of same or kind of direction. But when that happened, mm -hmm. you have uh, the welfare of uh, subsidizing the welfare of Germany for them not to have their own military or, and then they spend on a lot of dumb stuff, their own government or the same thing in Japan, right? Like Japan from having their own mechanized robots, but another, uh, <laughs> for another time. But so, you know, whenever <laughs> I handicap them and uh, you think there's a, there's a security that comes without uh, the work that's actually required to, to have that kind of security. So I think when, you went through all these problems, not just uh, in the military and then afterwards, and even in prison, uh, not saying like you hit bottom, but you, oh, I sure did. <laughs> you hit bottom. You're, you're forced then to be much more efficient with your time uh, and what you do next. Cause it's, you can't, yeah. can't waste it. Uh, every, every opportunity is 
it's a step then a second towards survival. And whereas if you're on welfare, for example, you know, you can, <clears throat> uh, you can ca- go around carefree. You don't have to make these decisions that are very important in your life to make uh, these uh, responsible areas that you have to go to, like, you know, like to get a job, to learn a skill and say, you know, right. money and, you know, and you kind of just uh, uh, hang off on that. Yeah. I mean, it is, it does create like a moral hazard there. And I got to go here in a second. So I, I want to um, bring this up. Yeah. So <clears throat> here's the thing is that you got to kill what you eat, man. That is, and that is intrinsic in the human. And you see people like that have like that, that are on welfare. Like they, the re, it's, 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 the poverty becomes generational. Like where I'm from, I'm from, there is like a, to use a social science term, there is a culture of poverty where like people's rights of passage if you're not like, like you guys said in the beginning of the episode, like your three pipelines are military, school, or prison. <laughs> so the thing is, um, you see, guy. I mean, like guys, when my hometown, I come from a small town in Appalachia. And if you don't go to the military, if you stay in town, because that's what most of the guys did, like not most, but quite a few guys did that. Uh, if you don't go to the military and you stay there, like people just sink into abject poverty. And like, there's, there's families that I grew up with that their big rite of passage when they, their kid turned 18, they take them down to job and family services and still had to sh- sign up for food stamps and all kinds of assistance. And that, yeah, it's like, it creates a moral hazard, like you said, because now you're not responsible for your actions, but it, it all circles back to this one thing. The failure in America is at the individual level. It's individual leadership, people that are not able to lead themselves. And you hear it on the news all the time. The news will always tell you, it's so-and-so's fault. It's this group's fault. It's the immigrants. It's the Republicans. It's the Democrats. It's the people on welfare. It's the blacks. It's the whites. It's the Hispanics. It, they'll always blame somebody. But they never, never, people are much less comfortable saying that, oh, maybe the reason things are where they are in my life is my fault. And unless you can say that, you can't take responsibility for your own life and your own success or failure. And if you don't do that, you'll never succeed. And like, like you climb back up from the bottom. That's exactly what I realized that I am. The reason I am sitting in this prison cell is because I put myself there. And yes, it is bullshit that I got locked up for self-medicating for the post-traumatic stress I was dealing with from serving the state. Yeah, that sucks. It's completely immoral. It's awful. But, I can't change that. And I can't change the fact that these drugs are illegal. I can't, you know, I want the wars to stop. I want them to stop killing innocent people. I want them, you know, I want the guys that, you know, I served with to stop blowing their fucking heads off because all the fucking immoral shit they had to do and all the, all the bullshit they've endured. But I can't change that. I can't change any of that stuff. But you know what I can do? I can change my own actions. And that's what I decided when I was sitting in that prison cell. I decided that, when I get out of here, I'm going to have to take charge of my own life for the first time ever because I basically just kind of coasted to that point. And yeah, I served in the military, but you know what? I always had somebody tell me what to do because that's what the military is. But, and it's easy in that kind of sense. However, though, once you are on your own, you have to be your own leader because you don't have an external leader anymore trying to police your actions. So that's what, that's people that succeed or fail it all hinges on that. If you can be your own leader, you'll succeed. If you can't, you're not going anywhere in life. Right. And I'm, I'm glad you, you share that. I mean, you know, for people who have difficulty, just ask yourself, uh, you know, this question, you know, what would one prod do? So, mm-hmm. Good. yes. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Matt Freeman, for coming on the show from uh, the status quo. And I appreciate your time yeah. uh, sharing your story. This is fun. Yeah. <laughs> just so you know, I don't know how far Northern Virginia of a drive is for you, but uh, the middle of next month, we're doing a camping weekend. It's called Anarchon. So, you know, it's if you about... need, it's uh, Sorry, Winchester, Virginia. So I don't know how far that is from you. Uh, I think it's about five or six hours, but yeah. Uh, once we, once we uh, get off recording, man, yeah, we'll find out details real quick. It's the only campground in all of Virginia that has a firing range. Two of them. You can shoot anything you want. I had a friend brought a... Uh, uh, awesome. Got a bear it out there. Yeah. Sweet. <laughs> well, for those uh, listening, stay liberated. Get off my property. Print guns, not money. <laughs> <laughs>